believe this. Detective Chief Inspector Catherine Goodwin also revealed that police discovered Cousins had been suspected of an indecent exposure offence in Kent just days before they found out that he was a serving officer. She made the comments in a new documentary, Sarah Everard, The Search for Justice, which will air tomorrow night, just days after the third anniversary of her murder. But three years on from Sarah Everard's murder, a staggering number of police officers have been convicted of crimes, including rape, and sexual assault, which leaves us again with the disturbing question of whether Cousins really was just one bad apple, or did he come, in fact, from a rotten tree? Joining me now is independent domestic abuse specialist and former police officer Bridie Anderson and forensic psychologist Dr Ruth Tully. Thank you both very much indeed for joining me. Let me start with you, Bridie, and discuss this notion of a bad apple, a bad penny, just a baddie who can turn up in, in any organisation, although, of course, Wayne Cousins was much, just much, much more than a baddie. But, but, but what did you see? What was your experience? Bad apples or, in fact, something rotten at the very heart of policing? I think in my experience, um, there is something about the power and control that is provided by the uniform, by the badge that attracts people. I think that there are a disproportionate amount of these so-called bad apples um, that are drawn to policing as a career because of that power and control. Um, so I don't think it's they are few and far between, sadly. Um, I think it is an issue with, one, systemically, how they're maybe not been challenged, um, or it's been ignored because we don't want to see it. Um, also because survivors and victims experiencing it maybe don't feel they'll be believed. That's part of the police perpetrators kind of common tactic. Um, I'm glad that we're seeing more coming out, but I think Ah, let me bring Ruth. It does up. just scratch the surface. Let me bring Ruth into this. Ruth, so Bridie talks about a kind of personality type there, doesn't she, really? Somebody who craves the power craves the authority, craves a position which entitles them to behave in ways that other jobs wouldn't let you, demanding that people do things, shouting, commanding, putting handcuffs on, you know, putting people in a subjugating position. Um, is there a personality type that, that, that is likely to want to join the police force that, that conforms to that description? Well, I've worked with several police officers convicted of very serious crimes. I must say former police officers now, of course. Um, and there's tended to be two different strands of those. One is people who happened to be in the police and who also offended, but then a different group who tend to be attracted, as you described, to that power control, um, the status that that role affords them. And what's interesting also within that is if you think about the hierarchy within the police in that those people who are within the police, they're also expected to conform, to conform to the expectations and standards potentially being shouted at and ordered about by those above them. And those who've joined for the purpose of power and control, in my experience, have also really struggled with that because their desire, of course, to, is to be at the top of that hierarchy. But what they've been able to do, unfortunately, is mask these tendencies because they've been able to control themselves in such situations. So if you spoke to a superior who'd been in charge of them, they might have no idea that that's the type of personality that they have. So unfortunately, it's quite hidden. But sadly, yes, I think it is a role that does attract people who crave authority, which, of course, we see then manifest in very serious offending in some people. Tell me also about a kind of personality type who will nurture and foster a culture where it's acceptable to behave in ways that are patently unacceptable so that they are um, sexist, misogynistic, violent, abusing the law rather than maintaining the law, unprofessional, all the sorts of things that any HR department in any business will absolutely decree are forbidden in the workplace and yet somehow a culture allows it to foster and nurture and and flourish this kind of behavior what what's going on there in terms of personality types 
Well, what we've seen reported in the press about WhatsApp groups and so on and these disturbing conversations that people have had is, in essence, a toxic, hyper-masculine culture that's being allowed to continue. And that's not unique to the police, unfortunately. It is present in other environments. But if you think about the police, its history, how women, in terms of starting to fight for equality, gaining more equality, but still being in a minority... Uh, their experiences within there and those who are looking out for women who are supporting them and don't hold these attitudes, it's simply not been enough. And there is that difficulty between a bad apple, so to speak, and how people refer to it anyway, who's going to go on to commit these serious offences, but those attitudes being maintained, normalised, supported by these horrendous cultures that, that or subcultures that can exist within organisations. I've got lots of experience of working in various organisations and cultural change within them is very difficult. These shifts are very, very difficult. And unfortunately, the news of, of what went on in the background in terms of the report that we discussed last week mm. um, and what's seems to continue to go on with these serious offences that have taken place since uh, Sarah Everard's murder by former police officers, it doesn't help us have that trust and it doesn't help us instill change any further. In fact, those people who can control themselves in these environments and they've got that aggressive underlying personality type, but are able to put on a show, deceive other people, they may be able to do that even more effectively, especially if they know people are now looking out for it and now more willing to challenge it. Challenging should be done, but we should be aware that people will try to hide it. Talk to me about why you've said that your experience has shown you that changing culture, you said twice, is very, very difficult. Why is it so difficult? You would imagine a new boss, a new broom, sweeping clean, a boss saying, right, zero tolerance now in this department of, and you list what the things are that you'll no longer countenance or put up with, anything, any, any idea that this is acceptable behaviour is from this morning finished. If there's any kind of uh, re repetition of these sorts of activities, then we are whistleblowing and we're encouraging it. This is how you do it. This is how you report anything of this kind. You could imagine smashing a culture in one morning really if you wanted to so why is it so difficult in practice largely in my experience it's because of the embedded nature of structures of procedures of the way in which change can be put forward and if you think about it needing to be a change, the change in itself is coming from a minority. So what you're trying to do is change a culture within a huge group where procedures already exist, where people may have worked there for many, many years and not see why they need to change because they might see themselves not being part of that problem. For example, this misogynistic culture um, and you know the very extreme such as cousins' terrible crimes. So people can feel like it's not their responsibility and enforcing that within um, a zero attitude, new culture that's trying to be introduced can be just be very, very difficult. Um, and often, in particular, you've got to think about are there women involved at the top who are trying to instill such changes and the unique challenges they might face in that role anyway, never mind trying to encourage and facilitate change. So it's largely about organisations taking time to embed changes and that individuals within the organisations might pose specific challenges that make change not occur at a speed that we would like, really. Let's talk to Bridie about this, because she's lived all this, haven't you, Bridie, from inside the police force, trying, I believe, to think about bringing about change, but knowing that you would be condemned for it, you would be reviled for it, you might even be demoted for it, you would be hounded and you would be, you know, jeered at, and it would be absolutely hideous and make your life incredibly unpleasant. Describe a little bit of the sorts of things that you wished that you could change that were going on in the police force when you were there and the steps that you took and what happened when you took them? Some of the things I wish I could change, I suppose, is just um, systemically, there isn't a great deal of security for officers in terms of if I tell someone this, if I whistleblow, I'm going to be protected. I know so many officers and staff, particularly women who have been further victimised and they've disclosed abuse when they've disclosed um, abuse of position for a sexual purpose um, or just really inappropriate behaviour from colleagues that actually they've then been shunned even if they get the support from the top um, like Ruth talked about that 
they're the kind of few versus the many and because you so rely on your shift on your colleagues to kind of literally protect your life at times being in that environment and being shunned and ostracized is so painful what then happens is other people see that and then they close down um so silence is bred um through that not only lived experience but seeing the lived experience of others for daring to kind of step up and say something and it can feel like swimming upstream to try and make those changes, to try and get people to understand that this can't be a knee-jerk reaction, it can't be tokenistic, it needs ongoing, sustained input, training, um, culture shift, a bit like watering a plant. You can't just plant a plant and expect it to grow and thrive. You have to keep maintaining it and watering it. And I think too often in organisations like policing, we may be knee-jerk react to something put some training in let's say we'll be trauma informed or we'll do this or we'll do a data wash of all of the vetting and then other priorities come up which is hard policing has lots of competing priorities um but i think we really need to focus on this in more than just words but in action um and really investing in this listening to people and some forces are doing great in that but we just need it to be every force it can't be a postcode lottery anymore well it's nine, 19 forces out of 48 forces submitted data that was asked for only 19 out of 48 that doesn't look promising let me ask you something else bridie when you're working in the police force were you aware of police officers maybe superiors of yours i don't know not just with an attitude problem you know not just misogynistic or um unreceptive to crimes involving women or sexual assault that kind of thing but actively breaking the law rather than just not enforcing it in the right way were you aware of law breakers among your colleagues Sadly, um, across both forces, I worked across two different forces in my service, and yes, in both. Um, I'm glad to say it always came as a shock. Um, it really did. It's it's heartbreaking. It's an affront to anyone who wears the badge. Um, but I knew it happened, and I'm seeing even more now that I've left the police service and I work directly with survivors. I'm seeing even more of that. Um, and just the amount of barriers that are in place for that to be reported, the confidence of victim survivors to be able to know that they'll be believed, listened to, um, it is providing a massive barrier to us kind of targeting even more of these police perpetrators, but also the will, there's got to be the will to really tackle it, not just with the criminal standard of proof, because that's hard with any crime, but with conduct, we have to be ensuring that we have robust conduct procedures in place um, so that these individuals are, are proven that they cannot hold the badge because they've constantly got access to vulnerable people and if they are seen as getting away with it and acting with impunity that's only going to teach others um, that this is an environment where that's accepted and we have to start really showing that that's not um, and I'm seeing it I am seeing that happen I mean, um, we... but like you the other um, guest said it, it's slow progress. I mean, we know, for example, that Wayne Cousins was reported for indecent exposure and the number plate of the car he was driving was clearly given. And, you know, it could have been investigated, he could have been found and he could have been brought to book. He wasn't. Nothing happened. It wasn't followed up on. It was an absolutely, you know, violently red flag that was completely ignored. Um, so, so were you aware of a culture where it was kind of nods as good as a wink kind of a thing, you know, yeah, old boy or old chap or my colleague, we see you breaking the law here, paying fast and loose with it. We're police officers, you know, you're our colleague. We sort of overlook it here. We don't look too closely into it. We turn a blind eye. Was that part of the culture, would you say? Maybe, you know, 15 years ago, certainly not recently. Um, it was never like that in terms of the forces I worked in. Um, it was maybe more of a, a lack of belief that actually, well, I've known this person, they're a good egg, they're a good officer, this can't possibly be true. It was almost like a professional bias um, rather than an outright, um, we want to protect corrupt people. I, I certainly never saw that, luckily. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but in my experience, it, it was more of an, this unconscious bias towards the fact that their colleagues wouldn't lie because they're a good cop or they're a good mate. Um, and not really understanding that there's no reason for a lot of these victims to lie and actually they're putting themselves at great risk by speaking up. Let, let me bring Ruth back into this. Ruth, um, 
is there, are there kind of psychometric tests or other tests that can be applied subtly in interviews to try to weed out the megalomaniac personality, the personality that wants to exploit power for his or her own good rather than to do good? Is it something that can be rooted out at interview stage? Or is it something that really, if you're set upon doing it, you can pull a fast one on any interviewer, no matter how experienced the interviewer? Uh, it's the latter, sadly, because personality testing can be done, but these boil down to personality tests that rely on self-report, looking at questions about how you see yourself, maybe those involving an informant, how does this other person see them? And also looking at corrobor corroborating behavior, looking at, the background and evidence behavior. And sadly, in those who might be trying to get a job to abuse the power um, within, for example, a policing role, they will of course hide the undesirable behavior. People might not know about that undesirable behavior. Um, so while some things could potentially be picked up within testing, even if they're more subtle, ultimately somebody can, if they truly want to, deceive the, the whole process. Um, we would look at personality assessment um, at a more detailed level in someone who has been convicted of serious offences because we've got that evidenced and proven behaviour or allegations of such behaviour that we can look at in the broader context of that person's history. I mean, there may be issues in their history that can be picked up through interview, which might tell us about their past behaviours, their tendencies, the way they approach other people. But if they want to mask things, you know, one, one traumatic experience happening to someone could enrich their life in a way in terms of looking at life in a different way if they're able to process the trauma. But for another person, it can contribute to them being angry at the world, angry at women. And we just don't know in any individual how they will interpret that without time and evidence. Uh, so unfortunately, it's very unlikely that you'll pick out these people pre-interview as much as you try, because particularly in careers and, and professionals and successful people, people who've gone through education, people who are socially skilled, they're going to be quite skilled at hiding those things. So it's only with evidence of behaviour that you can challenge and pick those things up. And sadly, it's often absent at that recruitment stage. Thank you both very much for joining me.